Okay, people are talking about the Oscars and especially the Best Picture nominees and you want to know what's going on, but you also don't want to watch 10 boring art piece films, right? Now, you could go watch a real critic, but if you're a normie, then you want someone who speaks your language. Have you ever been at Target and you ask somebody who's wearing a red shirt for help, but they actually don't work there, but then they just try to help you anyway? That's me, right now, a fellow normie, helping you with these films. So hang out with me for a bit. I'll give you the cliffs notes, the highs and the lows. I'll tell you my favorites and why. And as a bonus, I'll even recommend a few that you actually should watch because despite the Oscars being known for nominating films that no ordinary viewer would go within a mile of, there are a couple that are not the films that you might be thinking. Hey, while the Academy is voting on these movies, I need you to upvote me by hitting that like button. Mm, killed it! Okay, let's get the worst one out of the way. Bradley Cooper's Maestro is an absolute nightmare. If you're like me, you might have some negative connotations attached to the word film. It might evoke images of pretentious art house crap that is not at all visually pleasing, but people in black turtlenecks claim it's breathtaking. Maestro is that movie. This is the absolute definition of Oscar bait. However, I'm glad it's on the list because it provides a kind of bad example of how the elements of what make a great film can't just be blended together to guarantee success. It shares pieces with other movies on this list, yet their execution is correct and Maestro is just lazy. It's a biopic, and Oppenheimer's a biopic, yet the execution here is dismal. Maestro uses black and white, so does Oppenheimer, yet Maestro looks cheap, like it's trying too hard to appear cultured. Maestro changes the film effects depending on the decade. <gasps> the holdovers use film effects to look like it was a 70s movie. But Maestro is not subtle and the effects are jarring. Both Maestro and others use longer shots. But Maestro extends them way too far and they have no meaning. Maestro and Anatomy of a Fall have no story as we traditionally think of them. Yet Anatomy is a character study with mystery and Maestro is just a collection of scenes. Bradley Cooper clearly wants to be taken seriously. In Maestro, he threw every film element he could at it, and he chose a figure whose life has all the things that Hollywood thinks are interesting. Leonard Bernstein had substance abuse problems. He was bisexual, but married to a woman, so he had to balance his attractions behind closed doors. He was Jewish, so they can talk about anti-Semitism. He was a liberal political activist. His wife died of cancer. So much great drama, right? Oh, also... Uh, he was a talented composer and is well known for being an educator that made classical music accessible. So it's ironic then that this movie is the kind of pretentious crap that people assume classical music is and that's what Bernstein was trying to educate against. There were so many interesting lenses through which to tell the story of Bernstein's life, but Hollywood is only concerned with one thing. All I can tell you, sir, is that he's gay. Gay! Yep, the movie is not concerned with his educational efforts or musical talent, instead focusing on his marriage and mostly his sexuality. The movie has no real structure, it's just a collection of scenes spanning his whole life without any perspective or theme. They are simply presented to you. That presentation is also done in some of the most boring ways imaginable. Now look, I'm not a fan of modern Hollywood's TikTok editing style, where one shot is apparently not legally allowed to last more than one and a half seconds, so the screen is constantly jumping around. I'm consistently critical of movies and shows that don't allow one second for us to process what is happening. They don't let things breathe. Well, Mr. Cooper showed me there's too much of a good thing by giving us silent shots that just go on forever. This movie is just an absolute drag, and I wasn't able to sit and watch the whole thing. Fortunately, it is on Netflix, so after 45 minutes, I just began to watch it on my phone while cooking dinner. Toward the end of the movie, I remembered that Netflix has a speed option now, and I cranked it up to one and a half speed. At one point, Bernstein's wife, played by Carrie Mulligan, is near death and is crying in bed, and I thought... Oh my goodness, this scene is completely dragging. And then I remembered I was watching it at high speed. Do I think this movie has a chance at winning the Oscar? 
Yes, albeit slim. I think the Academy laps this kind of crap up. However, office culture has taught me that people do like to be fluffed, but they don't like it obvious. So this might not win because it's being too blunt with its begging. Also, Cooper is a white man and Bernstein was a Jewish man. Politics have always been a part of the Oscars, but ever since the hashtag Oscars so white slacktivist movement, they have been even more keenly aware of identity politics. So this one has a low chance. Poor Things probably deserves last place, but I cannot fully award it that ignominious position because it's the only movie on this list that I could not finish. I lasted 30 minutes and I noped right on out. It doesn't help that it was the 10th movie I would watched and I was just tired of this crap, but also, it's really gross. In what is supposed to be a dark comedy, Emma Stone plays Bella, a woman who threw herself from a bridge but was near to giving birth. Crazy surgeon Willem Dafoe replaced her brain with her infant's brain to observe what would happen. Then he hires a student to stay in his house and record observations about her development. The student falls in love with her, which is disgusting because she's literally acting like a toddler. She also discovers her body, and there are several scenes of her jilling off at the table or around the house. The student agrees to marry her after Defoe's encouragement, and lawyer Mark Ruffalo comes around with a marriage contract, and he promptly molests Bella. You nasty. That was at the 30 minute mark, and I had been ready to turn it off for the previous 10, so that was it. Defoe has an unsettling prosthetic on. He cuts up patients in his basement. Bella stabs a dead patient in the eyes multiple times after fondling him. It's just vulgar and gross on purpose, and I have such little patience for it. 99 times out of 100 graphic visuals like these are just a cover for lack of talent and story. And it's fully possible that this movie uses all of this to make some kind of point eventually, but I was not sticking around to find out. Everything about this movie screams pretentious artsy crap. Black and white? Check. Weird unnecessary camera technique? Check. And I'm talking really weird. Constant zooming in and out for no reason whatsoever. Fisheye lenses, pinhole cameras, a bunch of goofy techniques that have a purpose when used to evoke certain emotions in the viewer, but pointless when used at random. Do I think it's gonna win? I certainly hope not, but some of the degenerates in Hollywood might love this crap. It's also the kind of gross movie that people like to claim has super deep meaning, and those of us who don't like the visuals just don't get it. It's supposed to be on Hulu next week, so good luck with it if you decide to go in. Past Lives is a meeting that should have been an email. It's an idea that could have been told in 40 minutes, but they wanted a feature length film. This movie drags so hard, I think RuPaul tried to race it. Two Korean kids are sweet on each other, but the girl is leaving. Her family is immigrating to Canada. They live out separate lives, and 12 years later, he tries to find her online. They reconnect, and there's a rather sweet segment where they are talking every day at odd hours, rekindling their friendship, and perhaps leading somewhere. Sadly, they both had busy schedules and projects, and neither was going to be able to leave their respective countries for a while. Seeing that this was taking up all of her time and leading nowhere, she decides they should take a break. They don't talk again for 12 more years. He visits her in New York, where she has been married for a few years. He has a girlfriend, but for some reason, he just needs this closure before he can move on and marry her. They spend a day together, and he goes home. There you go. I saved you an hour and 45 freaking minutes. <sighs> this is so boring. The movie claimed that it was going to tell us something about In Yoon, the Korean belief that people's lives connect in the past and finally they're fated to end up together when they collect enough in Yoon. If it sounds like I don't fully understand the concept, that's because the movie barely touches on it. It comes up twice for a few seconds each time. The first is a voiceover as the girl is meeting her husband. The second is at the end when the boy says maybe they'll build up enough In Yoon to be together in a future life. Then he says, see you then, which was pretty sweet. And that's it. There is so much dead space in this movie. One of the characters should have been named Isaac. The only part of this movie worth watching is the video call sequence when they reconnect at the 12 year mark. It's adorable to watch a budding romance and special attention should be called to Greta Lee who thoroughly sold this. She fully embodied the young woman nervously excited to explore a new relationship. Her face sold it incredibly. 
everything else is horrifically boring, and it went nowhere. We get long, silent shots of nothing. We didn't explore what life might have been if we made different choices, which is how the movie is pitched. Right at the end, the guy says he imagines those things, but knows they aren't real, and then they go their separate ways. What the hell? Honestly, just go watch Serendipity. It's so much better. Do I think it will win? No, there's nothing special about this, and Koreans are not a protected political class at the moment, so. If you need help getting to sleep tonight, this one's on Paramount+. Plus. Zone of Interest was kind of a tough one to rank because it's such an interesting premise. It's a strange watch because it's mundane and unsettling at the same time. So the basic idea is a few weeks in the life of the family of the head commander at the Auschwitz concentration camp. They've got a really nice house that sits right against the fence line of the camp, and everything about their life is normal, except for, you know, the genocide happening on the other side of the wall. Like I said, it's unsettling to watch this normal family story that is honestly kind of boring, except the literal backdrop is a concentration camp. This movie is PG-13, so we never actually see any violence, which was a great decision in my opinion. It's honestly worse that you're forced to imagine the horrors on the other side of that wall while the wife walks her mother around the property casually talking about her vegetable garden. Scenes at night are partly lit by fires from the nearby furnaces. There are random gunshots and shouts and screaming in the background barely audible. It gets used a lot, but the best word to describe this movie is haunting. Oh. God, you are hard to look at. I also think it fights a bit of the tide of how we portray the Nazis, which is often poorly done, in my opinion. We dilute the term by throwing it around over every political squabble. And oddly enough, I think we often portray the Nazis as too evil, and it somehow makes them less frightening. They're usually comically, over-the-top sadists or weirdly obsessed with occult magic to win the war. And by portraying them as so psychotically inhuman, we actually lessen the frightening nature of the Holocaust. After all, if these people were so demonically evil and debased, then what they did becomes just an outlier. Only truly insane evil can perpetrate such acts, right? Except they weren't immensely special in the evil department. The German people were not some crazy exception to humanity. What this movie shows quite skillfully is that they were terrifyingly normal. They had regular lives. They were loving fathers and mothers, loved each other, had hopes and dreams, and also somehow saw an entire race of people as subhuman and didn't blink when they were exterminated. And it's important to be reminded that under the right conditions, we can ignore anything we want. Late in the movie, it cuts to a bunch of workers cleaning the windows and halls of the modern-day Holocaust Museum, completely unbothered by the artifacts of tragedy all around them, because they had a job to do. One particular scene to illustrate this was a group of women having coffee, idly discussing the articles of clothing they had gotten from the Jews. One joked that her friend got a dress that didn't fit, but she loved it, so she vowed to go on a diet to fit. Another announced that she found a diamond in her toothpaste, to which the others remarked on how clever those Jews are. The first woman laughed and said she ordered a bunch more toothpaste to see what else would be in there. Like it's a freaking Cracker Jack box. They're psychopaths. I'm not a psychopath, I'm just a high-functioning sociopath. Do your research. Now, what drags this movie down is the same mundanity that makes it so unsettling. The concept is cool, but actually watching it becomes a chore after a while, which, now that I'm thinking about it, might be secretly on purpose to demonstrate to the audience that they too can ignore what they want and become numb to horror quickly. The story, such as it is, is that the German officer and his wife have spent a couple of years here making this place a home, but he is skilled at his job and he needs to be transferred. He ends up traveling for work, and at the end it looks like he's going to go home, but we never find out. If you're in the mood for a somewhat boring but deep message kind of film, this one will likely be on HBO Max soon. Do I think it's going to win? Uh, Holocaust movies are easy to vote for, and it is an interesting, different perspective on the Nazis that succeeds in making them worse somehow. I think it has a moderate chance, especially being an A24 film, they are artsy and prone to awards in all the ways that you expect. In my opinion, Barbie was nominated entirely for political reasons. It is not a best picture because it doesn't achieve its aims because it doesn't seem to know what they are. 
Greta Gerwig delivered a final product that is just all over the place. Is it a feminist story? Well, she says it is, but Margot Robbie says it isn't. Is it an exploration of existentialism? Maybe. Is it a satire of modern gender stereotypes? Possibly. Is it a harrowing tale of women trying to find themselves in a world full of external expectations? Yeah, for about 90 seconds it is. Is it about gender equality? Could be. Is it a silly toy movie with no meaning whatsoever? Perhaps. I've seen numerous interpretations of this one, and in some cases that can be a good thing, when it's intended. But in the case of Barbie, it's just sloppy. In truth, like its main character, Stereotypical Barbie, this movie can be whatever you want. You can project onto it whatever feelings you desire, and some part of it will project those ideas back at you. But that doesn't make for a best picture, because the movie isn't truly saying anything. At best, it's echoing whatever you already brought into the theater. It does not have a cohesive theme, and its best moments happen in the first 20 minutes. After that, it diverges from itself from scene to scene, and finally, ends at the gynecologist office. Seriously, that's the final scene. <laughs> but cinematography wise, it looks outstanding. The costumes and set design in Barbie Land are great. The clash of Barbie and Ken in the real world is impactful. Ken's storyline is an actual character arc that includes the most humorous parts of the movie because it's one of only two times it wasn't taking itself so seriously. That opening 20 minutes had the potential for a great satirical piece. So. There are some quality bits, but they are weighed down by the tonal and thematic confusion of the rest of the movie. However, it had to be nominated because it spoke out against the Patreon. We already saw what happened when Greta and Margot didn't get nominations in their respective categories. Can you imagine what would happen if the movie didn't get a Best Picture nod? Barbie stands already think the movie's attempt to prove the evils of the Patreon have been proven because it wasn't nominated for every single category. Sadly, this one feels like a pity nomination because it just isn't a great film, especially looking at the rest of the field. If you haven't seen it, it opens by comparing itself to 2001 A Space Odyssey, which made me think it was going to be funny and self-aware. After the opening bit about Barbie Land being silly and, well, Barbie Land, Barbie begins to experience problems like flat feet and cellulite, which she learns is connected to the real girl playing with her. It turns out to be America Ferrara, who is sad because she doesn't have a connection with her daughter anymore. As Barbie tries to fix this situation, the Mattel board is trying to put her in a box. Subtle. Meanwhile, Ken is getting respect for the first time in his life and learns that it's because the patriarchy exists here in the real world, but the movie never shows what it is or how it works. In fact, showing that Ken has zero opportunities just because of his gender. So he goes back to Barbie land and somehow takes over with the power of the patriarchy. Barbie and America return to see this horrible situation and work to unbrainwash the Barbies. In the end, the moral is... You gotta be yourself, and work together, and be okay on your own, and learn to love others, but also learn to love yourself. Like I said, the moral is honestly whatever you want it to be. Some folks justify this nomination by pointing to its impressive gross of $1.2 billion at the box office. Mario also made a billion, and I had a good time watching it, but I'm not advocating that it be named Best Picture. Do I think it's gonna win? No. It's a pity nomination, and if there were still five nominees, this wouldn't be on the list. Do you need to watch it? I don't know, you might have fun, just keep your expectations low. I wanted so badly for American Fiction to be higher on the list, but it completely fumbled the execution. If you've seen the trailers, you probably think this movie is a satire of American entertainment commodifying black stories, but only the ghetto kind. You think this is a modern day retelling of Spike Lee's Bamboozled, and you would be wrong. In what might actually be a meta twist, this movie is about 25% those things. The rest of it is a family drama. Yeah, just basic family dysfunction stuff. All right, so the idea is main character Monk is a published writer, but he's not super successful. His agent tells him that publishing houses want stories that are more black. And he sees a reading of a female black author who has written a book called Weez Was In The Ghetto, and it sounds like hotcakes. Yo, Sharonda, girl, you be pregnant again? If I is, Ray Ray is gonna be a real father this time around. He writes an angry parody called My Pathology, which is full of idiotic black tropes. And of course, it goes crazy. 
People call it real and raw and authentic. Now Monk has to deal with this fake second life and wonders if he is perpetuating stereotypes. The issue is that the phone call about the script being picked up and everything, that's like 45 minutes in. Before all of that, Monk's sister dies, his mother has early onset Alzheimer's, and his brother is freshly divorced because his wife found him in bed with a man. Monk's father offed himself years ago, and while they're at the family beach house, he starts dating a woman across the street. It wants to be a dark comedy and also a family drama at the same time, and it doesn't do either one all that well. It also doesn't know how to wrap itself up or answer its own questions. It literally ends as a series of possible endings because we discover that Monk has come clean, I, I guess, and is discussing the ending of the story with a producer and they run through a couple of scenarios of how the story might end. There is basically no resolution and I guess he's selling out, but in a really weak way. It's not even like a, a it's Chinatown Jake kind of a moment. The movie just peters out at the end. They thought meta humor lampshade hanging would be cool and it almost never is. It also doesn't try to delve into any of the questions surrounding this subject and it could have been so meaningful in this way. Monk is tired of the black experience only being about the struggle. Personally, this was an angle I wanted to see. He is, after all, a PhD writer. His siblings are doctors and so was his dad. He's not part of the struggle and it would have been a thought-provoking angle to explore whether he feels inauthentic because he he hasn't had real black experiences or if other black people treat him that way or they could have explored the idea of some black people commodifying themselves because hey money and clout i figured it wise up when they dropped a bag of cash at his feet like that one yeah who the hell wouldn't take this kind of money what i was truly hoping for was the idea that everyone sees everyone else as a series of boxes because we don't have time to truly know everyone around us or the idea that we fetishize certain cultures or focus on extremes like ghetto blackness or traditional Asian cultures or tribal Africans or whatever other culture has cool traditional costumes because our lives are quite boring. I mean, my suburban life is pretty bland and normal, so why would I want to read about someone else's ordinary life just because they have a different skin tone? This movie could have explored that rather universal idea through a black lens, but sadly, it barely even brought up most of these issues, and when it did, it continued the tradition of presenting them as unique black problems instead of the more universal ideas that they are. In an ironic way, the movie plays into the tropes that it seems to be talking about. There were some funny parts, though. In the beginning, he's teaching about Southern literature, and they're talking about a book with the N-word in the title, and a white girl with blue hair says they shouldn't have to look at that word because it's so hurtful and offensive, to which Monk looks shocked and says, uh, if I can get over it, I think you can too. Later, he's on a judging panel to give out some literary award, and the other that other female black author he doesn't like is on the panel as well. His own fake book gets entered, and of course, he's against it because he still cannot believe anybody is taking this seriously. Both of them are against the book for various reasons, but the other three white judges are slobbering all over how real and important and brave this book is. When the two black people vote no, they're told, well, three to two, so this book wins the award, and then the white woman judge gushes about how great it is this book won, because more BIPOC voices need to be heard and listened to. The guy who asked him to be on the panel also just admits to him he's calling only black people because the organization is catching heat for not being diverse enough. Overall, the movie feels lost, and writer-director Cord Jefferson wants to make a bold statement but he can't decide which one or how boldly he wants to make it or how deeply he wants to look into the subject. And what we're left with feels a bit shallow. Will it win the award? No, but it would be really funny if it did because it directly makes fun of organizations that purposely staff up people of color to appear more diverse, which the Academy has been doing for a few years now. It also pokes at books that get turned into movies that only exist so people can call them important and needed. Should you see it? I think you should pass. It raises a few interesting ideas, but never explores them and is rather boring. Martin Scorsese got rather self-indulgent when he decided to cut Killers of the Flower Moon at three and a half hours long. I can't keep doing this forever. It's been 20 seconds. Call it. 
here's the surprising thing. It's actually an interesting movie, but it could have used some fat trimming. The premise is that the Osage Indians have found oil on their land, and this brings in oil companies and towns that spring up to support the oil business. The movie states that the Osage were the richest people per capita in the world at that time. The movie opens up with Leonardo DiCaprio's character arriving in town, coming home from World War I. He goes to meet his uncle, Bill Hale, played by Robert De Niro, also called the King of the Osage Hills by his sycophants. DiCaprio's character, Ernest, is kind of dumb, and Bill Hale takes him under his wing and starts influencing him to find an Osage wife. Hale wants to start marrying members of his family to the Osage to intermix with them and take their oil rights. DiCaprio falls in love with Molly, played by Lily Gladstone, and they marry. On the side, however, he's working with Hale to cover up murders of Indians around town. The Osage tend to have health problems, but Hale doesn't want to wait around for them to die, so he begins finding hitmen to murder them and concentrate their wealth into his family's hands, all while speaking their language and being a friend to the Osage. Things begin to spiral out of control, and murders and deaths and her family begin to take their toll on Molly, which is upsetting to Ernest because he does love her. He starts to see that Hale is not a great man, but he's really torn. Again, he's kind of slow, so he's easily manipulated by Hale. Finally, the newly founded FBI shows up to investigate the murders, and things unravel. Unlike so many of the nominees here, this at least has an actual story. Characters have arcs. There is a traditional rising action, climax, and resolution, so we normies can follow along with the normal flow of a story. And this movie makes for engaging discussion, because aside from the true story that it tells, this film is really an inspection of human nature, and specifically our propensity toward greed. At first blush, it looks like the typical blame the white people story, but when you look at the whole thing, you see that the Osage were just as greedy as the settlers. They wanted the fancy clothes, the high-end alcohol, the nice cars, the jewelry, the servants, all the trappings of wealth. And there's a warning here about what you use using you in return. There's also a look at how people see it as unfair when someone has more than them. Yeah, the settlers were jealous of the Osage because in their eyes, they just got lucky and didn't work for their money, which is the same way we talk about rich people today. And we in the middle class are greedy for our own luxuries as well. For as much as people online complain about capitalism, it's not some conscious being that is out to get you. The darker parts of capitalism are when both parties use each other. You use a product or business because you want to feel good or important or save time or whatever. And that business is using you right back for your money. It's mutual toxicity, and it's what we see between the Osage and the settlers in this movie. We also see how powerful people pretend to be friends with people, all while undermining them. Um, if Bill Hale were running for election, he might, for example, say, if you don't vote for me, you aren't a real Osage. Killers of the Flower Moon feels horribly long because it is, but it would have felt even longer without the great acting. DiCaprio, De Niro, and Gladstone have presence, and they really sell these scenes. I believe the movie would have felt awful if not for them. Even with them, it still felt long. It's three and a half hours, guys. Three and a half. That's a lot of movie. However, Scorsese is a name that you know with good reason. He knows how to direct a high quality picture, and his experience comes through here. Do I think it'll win? It has a high chance. Greedy white guys plus Scorsese's name are big selling points. On the other hand, I wouldn't call it an amazing film, and it's possible the judges will agree. You can find this one on Apple Plus if you're interested. If you like period dramas and you've got an extra four hours, I think that you will at least not regret seeing it. How's that for a recommendation? Anatomy of a Fall is a peculiar one, and I'm surprised it ended up so high on this list. And to be honest, I don't have the film knowledge or terminology to effectively communicate why. This movie doesn't have a traditional story in the way that we would think of it, and yet I was gripped the whole time. It wasn't like a courtroom thriller like A Time to Kill or Primal Fear or something like that but I was still hooked. This one stars Sandra Hewler, who was also the wife in Zone of Interest, so good year for her. She's a German author living in France with her French husband, who is also a writer, but not as successful. They live in a chalet with their son, who is mostly blind. The film opens with her attempting to give an interview with a writing student, but the husband is upstairs doing renovations and is blasting music, seemingly on purpose to annoy her and disrupt the visit. The student leaves, and we see Sandra go upstairs, and her son takes the guide dog for a walk. When he comes back, 
he finds the corpse of his father in the driveway, seeming to have fallen to his death. Or was he pushed? The rest of the movie follows the questions that surround the death and the eventual charges. There are basically only three settings. The courtroom, inside the house, and outside the house. As the movie goes on, we discover new information about their relationship. The son begins to get confused and changes his testimony. The whole case is quite messy and confusing. Sandra claims she didn't kill the husband, but also doesn't want to believe that he threw himself, but the evidence suggests that the whole thing being an accident is unlikely. Like I said, the premise is very simple, but the drip of info, the acting, and the interesting use of camera to evoke emotion somehow kept me engaged the entire time. My friend Echo Chamberlain wants this to win Best Picture real bad, and honestly, he has the language to describe it better than me, so I'll link it below. Do I think it will win? I don't think it's likely. Although it is a foreign film, it's rather white and not quite artsy enough to capture the high-minded voters. Should you watch it? I think so. And you can find it on Hulu later in March, or you can rent it for like six bucks on your service of choice. I think that you'll be surprised at how engaging this movie is, and it's a fun discussion piece because the film never tells you what happened. So you get to decide for yourself. I'll tell you, I think this is on my short list for winners. The Holdovers is about a boys boarding school over Christmas break. Everyone goes home to their rich parents, except a few unfortunate kids who stay at the school as holdovers. And one teacher every year draws the short straw to supervise them for a couple of weeks. This year, it's Paul Giamatti, a curmudgeonly teacher with high standards that his rich kid pupils rarely live up to. Shortly after the break begins, four of the kids get whisked away to a ski trip, but one kid's parents can't be reached. So it's just the teacher, head cook Mary, and this troubled kid, Angus Tully, who is highly intelligent, but has behavioral issues and he keeps getting kicked out of boarding schools. What follows is a feel-good drama where the three characters learn there's more under the surface for most people, and they need to let go of something in the past to move forward. Just like Inside Out so aptly demonstrated, this movie is just sad enough in parts to make the heartwarming parts that much more impactful. Something that I absolutely love about this movie is that it doesn't portray Giamatti's character as inherently wrong for basically being a hermit in this school. He likes to be alone. He likes to read about and teach about ancient civilizations. He's not a people person. He understands it's off-putting. He has high standards for some students and will not pass some kid just because his dad's a big donor. And while he learns that sometimes it makes life a little easier to get on with people, it doesn't shame him for being an introvert. He definitely has character flaws, but has accepted them and their consequences and keeps to himself. It might just be me getting older, but Emily Gilmore did nothing wrong. And neither does Professor Giamatti here. Another great thing about this one is the dialogue, especially coming from Giamatti's character. The insults and turns of phrase in this are excellent and fitting of a grumpy old history teacher. Philistines. Lazy, vulgar, rancid little Philistines. Sir, I don't understand. That's glaringly apparent. I can't fail this class. Oh, don't sell yourself short, Mr. Coates. I truly believe that you can. Welcome back, snarling Visigoths. Listen, you hormonal vulgarian, that woman deserves your respect, not your erotic speculation. The writing here is superb and never feels wooden. Your mind's a cesspool and a shallow one at that. The inclusion of third character Mary is what helps to deepen this story. She is the head cook for the school and is a little bitter because she only worked there so she could send her son. But since they aren't rich like all these other kids, he enlisted to get the GI Bill for college, but he was killed in Vietnam before the movie begins. Mary is the grounded character reminding the professor that he's being a curmudgeonly ass, but also backing him up when student Angus is being, well, you know, a teenage boy. She provides a much-needed third dynamic so the movie isn't just another grumpy old guy and troubled youth story. The whole movie just feels cozy. I mentioned the feel-good nature of the story, but also the shots themselves. If you're used to action movies, it might feel jarring to have a shot last longer than two or three seconds and not be smash-cutting from one thing to the next, but I found it kind of relaxing. They also went for an older feel for this movie. The film takes place in the 70s, and they wanted to give the visuals a 70s film feel, which I think the Academy is going to favor. It features a lot of 70s music, which is the best decade for music all around. They also shot everything in locations they could find in Massachusetts. None of this was on a soundstage. At one point, they go to a house party, and that's a real house that somebody just kept that way. The movie sets feel lived in, 
because they literally are. Guys, this movie's the whole package, and if you already have a Peacock subscription to watch The Office or Parks and Rec or Psych or Brooklyn Nine-Nine or... You're gonna love this movie, and you should check it out. Sadly, it is rated R, mostly for language and a little drug use and one flash of a nudie magazine, which feels unnecessary, but I think it uses the rating to tell the story. Will it win? I think it has a low chance. On the one hand, it's extremely white and male, but on the other hand, it does make fun of spoiled rich white kids, and Mary's character embodies the less fortunate people who have to fight wars in their place. What might hold this one back is that it's not outstanding. It's just consistently quite good. There are plenty of period pieces, there are plenty of feel-good dramas, this is a great movie, but it might fall just a bit short of best picture for the year because of the competition. Oppenheimer blew me away. Seriously, I had low expectations for this one, and the three hour timer really made me nervous. However, I was pleasantly surprised. This is a pretty straightforward biopic about Oppenheimer and the development of the atomic bomb, but it addresses some of the politics involved in science that I didn't know about in this instance. I guess I just never really thought about it. Like, they made the bomb, the rest is history. What's interesting here is the exploration of how the government uses science to its own advantage, and politics get played even among the high-minded paragons of intellect. This movie is quite poignant in light of the recent few years where everyone wanted to clothe themselves in science, thinking it is the shield against all criticism. But in Oppenheimer, we see that science is colored by why it's being pursued, then colored again by who uses it. Science and politics are inseparable, and scientists aren't always the pure paragons of principled pursuit we place on pedestals. We also still haven't figured out that is does not equal ought. Oppenheimer was a liberal and was interested in the ideas of communism, and also interested in pushing quantum physics as far as he could, and, according to this film, interested in being the smartest and most respected and most desired guy in the room. A large majority of the movie addresses his intentions in making the bomb and showcasing the mistrust the government had in him once he spoke out against its use and because of his communist connections. Something to appreciate about this movie and what makes the three hour runtime bearable is the framing of his life through two lenses in two time periods. One is the confirmation hearing of Robert Downey Jr.'s Louis Straws to a cabinet position. Some of his congressional hearings centered around his relationship to Oppenheimer and is used to inform certain scenes. The other is the security clearance review of Oppenheimer himself, where various characters are interviewed about the time developing the bomb. What makes these scenes a great choice is that it allows the characters to voice internal monologue without it sounding like an exposition dump. The clearance panel can ask a character what they were feeling about Oppenheimer during a certain period, and they can give the audience a preface to what we're about to see or explain why it means something. Same thing for the congressional hearing and the side scenes where RDJ is taking recesses and discussing the questions he's getting from the congressman. Again, it gives us context for these scenes about Oppenheimer without a character having to basically look into the camera and tell us what's going on and why it's important. Biopics are hard to pull off, and including these scenes was a clever way to keep the audience in the loop without boring us and pepper in the lasting consequences of Oppenheimer's work and decisions. Now is the part where I have to complain about the nudity. For reasons I don't understand beyond the obvious, ooh boobies, Florence Pugh's boobs are out several times in this one. And it's a real shame because I enjoyed this movie so much that I wanted to watch it with my kids. Like, here's an interesting American historical figure and overall just a well done movie. Here kids, this is quality. Now please stop watching videos where people say yeet. It's just odd and unnecessary every time it happens. The first time is especially silly because the entire scene seems to only exist so Oppenheimer can say the I am become death line. Yeah. Yeah, there it is! There it is! Christopher Nolan is skilled enough to portray the same ideas without the tits, so it just feels lazy and a little horny. My wife and I are in disagreement, however, about the representation of Oppenheimer's conscience getting to him. At multiple points, he zones out of a conversation, and a stomping sound starts building, and the room he's in starts shaking, and the focus gets blurry. He's imagining the marching of troops and the explosions happening because of his work, and I think it's a vivid way to show his internal struggle. Killian Murphy also does a great job of selling the facial emotion. However, my wife found it to be distracting and did not convey what he was thinking and feeling. Again, if you've got Peacock, you already have this one, and it's definitely worth a three-hour investment. Do I think this one's gonna win? 
Yes, it has a real shot. Nolan is famous for his excellent work, and this is no exception. Biopics play well with the Academy, and this one is exceptional in that it is a well-done film while also being an enjoyable experience that doesn't feel like a chore. He blended both worlds and made a high quality picture that is also a blockbuster crowd pleaser without being shallow and cheesy. Thank you so much for hanging out with me during this Oscar trash course. I hope you learned a few things and maybe picked up a few recommendations you want to check out. Who do you think is going to win and why? Let me know down below. And as always, I appreciate you watching and I'll see you next time.